Hello, I'm Carl Laney, and it's my privilege to give you a lecture on Matthew's Gospel today. We're going to look at a survey of Matthew's Gospel all the way from chapter 1 to chapter 28. So tighten your seatbelt and uh, turn to Matthew chapter 1. The Gospel of Matthew, Matthew, the good news of Israel's Messianic King. So as we come to the Gospels, it's important to recognize that we have four sources of the life of Christ. Matthew, Mark, and Luke tell us about the life of Jesus, and these are called the synoptic Gospels. The word synoptic means seen together with. Matthew, Mark, and Luke give us parallel accounts of the life of Jesus. The Gospel of John is a little bit different. It gives us the life of Jesus, but Whereas the Synoptic Gospels focus on Jesus' ministry in Galilee, the Gospel of John focuses on Jesus' ministry in Judea and in Jerusalem. So we're, we're going to look at the Gospel of John later on, but we're going to focus our attention today on the Gospel of Matthew, which is parallel to the Gospel of Mark. Both Matthew and Mark tell the story of Jesus, and Mark is more of a condensed version of this story of Jesus. So first thing, first thing we need to know is who wrote this gospel, the gospel of Matthew. And we find that the gospel of Matthew was written by a man named Matthew, Levi. And we discover that he's a Galilean tax, tax collector. He was collecting taxes for the Roman government in the time of the first century. And of course, he would benefit from those uh, that collection of taxes and enrich himself as he did so. So he was a bit of a traitor to his own Jewish people, really uh, taking more money than he would have uh, been required to take and enriching himself. But Jesus was preaching in Capernaum, and that's where Matthew Levi was serving as a representative of the Roman government collecting taxes. And he heard of what Jesus was teaching. And he became a disciple, a learner about Jesus, and was eventually appointed as an apostle. Matthew, a tax collector, becomes an apostle, a, a disciple of Jesus, and an appointed servant of the Lord. Who did Matthew write for? Well, it's pretty clear that he wrote for his own Jewish people. He uses 61 Old Testament quotations. And these quotations are designed to connect with the Jewish people and help them understand that this Jesus is the Jewish Messiah. In his uh, genealogy, he links Jesus to the great patriarch Abraham and the leader of the nation, David, to whom the special covenants were made. Abraham and David, uh, God made covenants with them. And Matthew wants to know that Jesus comes in fulfillment of these covenants. There's a big debate as to whether Matthew or Mark wrote first, and many will say that since Mark is the shorter gospel, he must have written first, and then Matthew expanded on what Mark had presented. But tradition says that Matthew was the first gospel, that the gospels of the genealogies were written first, and I think that is, is a correct understanding. So I believe that Matthew wrote probably around AD 50, for the Jews who had not yet heard about Jesus. The setting of Matthew's gospel is the life of Jesus, and we can date his birth around 5 or 4 BC. We know this because uh, we know from history that Herod died after the birth of Jesus, and Herod died in 4 BC. So sometime in 5 or early 4 BC, Jesus was born. His death can be calculated based upon the what we know about Passovers and the dates of Passovers in the time of the first century. And so we can calculate his death April 3rd, AD 33. His ministry continued 40 days after his resurrection to his ascension. And if we put this all together, we believe that Jesus was about 35 or 36 years of age when he died and then ascended to heaven. <clears throat> 
In terms of the purpose of this book, it's pretty clear that Matthew writes to demonstrate that Jesus is the promised Messiah. Now, this word Messiah means anointed one, and it was used of kings and prophets who were given a special mission by God, and they were anointed with oil, which gave them a special standing before the people of Israel. They were God's chosen instruments for a specific purpose. And Jesus was that chosen instrument to represent God on earth. The, uh, the Gospel of Matthew includes this phrase often repeated, that it might be fulfilled. In other words, the promises that were made by the prophets are being fulfilled in the life of Jesus. And so when Matthew records what Jesus did, he says, this happened that it might be fulfilled according to the prophets which had been spoken earlier. The theme of the book is Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Judeans. I know this is normally translated King of the Jews, but the term Judeans is a better rendering of this, this, uh, this Greek term. Uh, because what we understand about Judaism has really changed since the time of the first century. And although these people uh, were the ones with whom God had made the covenants, uh, the Judaism of today is not the Judaism of the first century. These were Ju Judeans, uh, descendants of the tribe of Judah. And so I translate this, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Judeans. And these Judeans, some were religious and some were not. Some were politically oriented, some were uh, uh, more religiously oriented. But they recognized that Jesus was king. And uh, this was put on the... Uh, on the cross uh, as the, tr the, the, uh, uh, the charge against Jesus, Jesus of Nazareth, king of the Jews or better rendered Judeans. Matthew uses this phrase, this took place in order to fulfill prophecy. Ten times he uses that phrase. And then he adds a quotation from the Old Testament. In addition to these phrases, this took place in order to fulfill prophecy. Matthew uses 61 quotations from the Old Testament in his gospel. Richard Hayes, in his book, Reading Backwards, as he discusses Matthew's use of the Old Testament, he says that Israel's sacred history is presented by Matthew as an elaborate tapestry designed to point forward to Jesus and his activity. So Matthew is constructing his gospel in such a way to show that Jesus is the promised Messiah and the prophecies are being fulfilled in him. Let's consider the outline of Matthew's gospel. The first four chapters really focus on the introduction of the king. And here we learn about his background, his genealogy, about his birth, about his baptism, about his temptation. Matthew goes into chapter 4, 12 through the end of chapter 7 to tell us about what Jesus taught, the proclamation of King Jesus. And his basic message is about the kingdom. Repent, the kingdom is at hand. We'll say more about that in a minute. In chapters 8 through 10, Jesus authenticates his message by miracles. He demonstrates by his miracles that he is whom he claimed to be. And so we have a number of miracles, and these aren't just there to entertain or to attract attention, but these are designed to authenticate. These are his credentials to demonstrate that he is, in fact, God, and that he's doing God-like things here on this earth. Some people believed in Jesus, others didn't. And so we have the beginnings of controversy over King Jesus in chapter 11, verse 1, and that continues through chapter 14, verse 12. Controversy, is he really the Messiah or is he not? The Judeans expected that the Messiah would raise an army and liberate his people from their foreign oppressors. And Jesus wasn't doing that. He didn't raise up an army. So there was debate as to whether he was the Messiah or should they wait for another uh, Messiah, a Messiah who would uh, lead an army against their oppressors, against the Romans. In chapters 14, 13 through the chapter, end of chapter 20, we have the instruction of King Jesus. 
And here he teaches them more about the kingdom. He teaches his disciples and trains them in terms of what he wants them to understand. He teaches them about, about the church. He teaches them about marriage. He teaches them about the Holy Spirit, about discipleship, about purity. And so Jesus is instructing his people in these chapters. Chapter 21 brings us to the presentation of King Jesus. Now he's been presented to his people all through his, his life, but now the official presentation in the very prophesied way as Jesus comes into Jerusalem riding on the colt of a donkey. He comes in the prophesied way riding on the colt of a donkey on the very prophesied day according to Daniel's prophecy. He comes into Jerusalem presented as Israel's king. Chapters 24 and 25 uh, record Jesus' Olivet Discourse. Up on the Mount of Olives, the disciples see the city of Jerusalem, and Jesus tells them that it's all going to be destroyed. And then he begins to tell them more about the future, not just the historical future, but the eschatological future, the day of the Lord and the things that will happen uh, before his uh, return to earth. In chapters 26 and 27, we see the rejection of King Jesus. And here we see the religious leaders turn against him. They have him arrested. They have him tried. Uh, they have him crucified. And uh, all of that it represents the rejection of Jesus. He's buried in a tomb. But the story isn't over. And in chapter 28, we read of the resurrection of King Jesus. And uh, Jesus is brought back uh, from the dead, and he appears uh, to his disciples and, uh, and sends the apostles out to preach and teach the message of the gospel to the nations. That's the overview of Matthew's gospel. We'll get into the details in just a little bit. There's another way of looking at Matthew's gospel, and that is based upon its structure. And many scholars have noticed that there are five lectures or discourse, uh, discourses in Matthew's gospel with a preamble at the beginning and an epilogue at the ending. Each of these five discourses concludes with the words, when Jesus had finished these words, he went on and did something else. And we have that at the end of chapter 7 and the, at the first verse of chapter 11. And you can look at the end of each one of these discourses when Jesus had finished these words. He went on to do, do something else. Some people compare this with the five books of the Torah, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. But there seems to be no exact correspondence between these five discourses and the topics addressed in the, in the Pentateuch, the Torah. So this is a different way of looking at Matthew's gospel. Uh, it's a structural way of examining the book, but I prefer the thematic outline, which we saw before, because it gives me more information. The uh, introduction of the king, the, uh, the background of the king, and all those uh, points of the outline, I think, are more helpful to understand what Jesus was doing and what Matthew wanted us to remember. So Jesus uh, was born, raised, and lived in the land of Israel. It's a small country, about 150 miles north to south. I hope some of you will uh, save your shekels and make that trip to Israel someday. I'd love to take you with me on one of my tours to Israel. 150 miles north to south, about 50 miles east to west, on the Mediterranean Sea, it's uh, the sea level is at zero, but when you get up into the hill country, uh, the elevation goes up to about 3,000 feet. Jerusalem is about 2,500 feet above sea level, so it's in the mountains and gets an occasional snowstorm. Chronological highlights in the life of Christ. We've noticed his birth, 54 BC, his baptism, A.D. 29, and his crucifixion, April 3rd, A.D. 33. And we can fill in the, the sections between each of these chronological highlights with more detail as we study the life of Jesus. But these are uh, the basic dates that you need to remember uh, to 
set the life of Jesus in its historical context. So I, I advise you to remember these dates. A.D. 29, the beginning of his ministry with his baptism. Uh, the end of his ministry with his crucifixion. Followed by, of course, 40 days of his um, resurrection ministry and then his ascension to heaven. We look at Luke's gospel and he mentions that Jesus was in his 30s or about 30 at his baptism. It doesn't actually say he was 30, but about 30 in his 30s, Luke 3, 23. And so I suggest that Jesus lived about 35 or 36 years. And this little chart helps us to see how that uh, adds up because there were three years plus before AD 1 from 5-4 to 3 to 2 to A.D. 1, about three years, maybe a, a little more. And then there's 32 years plus uh, at the time of his crucifixion. He's crucified in the spring. So from A.D. 1 to A.D. 32, plus a little bit, you've got 32 years plus a few months. This all adds up to about 35 or 36 years of ministry on the earth. Okay, the first section of the book, the introduction of the king. And here we are looking at Matthew chapter 1 uh, through 411, the introduction of King Jesus. And Matthew is concerned to trace the life of Jesus back to some key figures like Abraham, to whom was given this covenant promise in Genesis 12, 1 through 3. Abraham was promised a land, a nation, and blessing. And Jesus comes in fulfillment of that promise. And then he connects Jesus with David, 2 Samuel chapter 7. Jesus is promised, or David is promised that he's going to have a son who will sit on his throne, who will rule and reign forever. And then when uh, Mary is told by the angel Gabriel that she's going to have a child, the angel Gabriel tells Mary that Jesus, her child, is going to come in fulfillment to the promise that is was made to David by the by the angel uh, by the Lord in 2 Samuel 7. So here we see that Jesus in his birth is connected to the promise that is made to David in 2 Samuel chapter 7. You can see that in Luke 1, 32 and 33. The genealogy of Jesus uh, provides his ancestry, but it also demonstrates that Jesus has a legal right to the throne because he, he comes as the legal adoptive son of Joseph. In the genealogy of Jesus, we see while he is the legal adopted son of Joseph, Matthew is concerned to demonstrate that Jesus is not the physical son of Joseph. And uh, this is uh, evident in verse 16. Jacob was the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, out of whom Jesus was born. And the words of whom indicate that Jesus is the child of Mary, not the son of Joseph. His legal son, his adopted son, but not his physical son. Mary alone is the human uh, contributor to the conception and the life of Jesus. Notice in the genealogy that four women with four interesting stories are mentioned. Usually a genealogy would include only men, but here we have a reference to Tamar. Uh, and uh, she was uh, the wife of Judah and uh, Rahab. Uh, and we rem are re reminded of what a Rahab did in terms of intervening for the spies at Jericho. Then Ruth in the period of the judges and Uriah, the wife of Uriah, uh, in the time of David. Uriah was the wife of uh, Bathsheba, whom David married. And, and the interesting thing here is that God has been faithful in preserving the Messianic line, even through Gentiles. It's not just about Jews. There are Gentiles in the Messianic line. Well, I think that's significant because Jesus didn't come just for the Jews. He came for the non-Jews as well, the Gentiles like us.
what evidence do you see in Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 through 25 for the virgin birth? I'm going to ask you to look at the, those uh, verses and determine for yourselves what evidence there is for the virgin birth. I think you'll see there is some strong evidence in this passage for the true doctrine of the virgin birth of Jesus. Now, what I see in Matthew's gospel is a funnel of prophecy that draws our attention to one single figure in history, and that is Jesus. And Jesus is the one who is the son of woman in uh, Genesis chapter uh, 3, that he is the descendant of Judah, that he is born in Bethlehem, that he's born of a virgin, Matthew chapter 1, that he's rejected, that he's crucified, that he's raised from the dead, and all of these things were pr uh, prophesied. And so all these prophecies focus on one single person in history, and that is Jesus, the Messiah. And Matthew wants us as readers to see that, particularly he wants his Jewish friends to understand that Jesus, who is born of a virgin, has come in fulfillment of prophecy. The funnel of prophecy focuses on one single figure in history, Jesus of Nazareth. What is the significance of the virgin birth? We know it's true. We know it's an orthodox doctrine, but I believe there's more to it. The virgin birth points to the uniqueness of Jesus. <laughs> I wasn't born of a virgin, and neither were you, but uh, Jesus was, and that is because he is divine. His father was God. He is the son of God. But beyond that, Jesus inherited no sin from Adam. You and I have inherited sin from Adam. But Jesus had no human father through whom he would inherit sin, the inherited sin of Adam. So Jesus is not only sinless by his actions, but he is sinless by his inheritance. He has no inherited sin from Adam. So the virgin birth of Jesus is not just good doctrine. It's, uh, it's important to understand what it says about Jesus. He is divine and he's sinless. Jesus was born in the time of King Herod. It was toward the end of Herod's life, and he was not a, a person that the Judeans loved or appreciated because he wasn't Jewish. Uh, Herod was Edomite. He was of Edomite descent. You remember Jacob and Esau, and Esau was the father of the Edomites, and there was conflict between the uh, the uh, Israelites and the Edomites, and Herod was one of the enemies of the Israelites. He encountered much opposition during his rule. He tried to impress his, uh, his subjects by building uh, magnificent uh, cities and, and temples and, and places uh, that he, by which he could be remembered, fortresses. He was a great builder. But he was plagued with domestic, domestic problems. And you would too if you had 10 wives like Herod did. Herod had 10 wives. And uh, this created a lot of problems in his homes as his wives and his children really vied for his attention and uh, wanted to, uh, his sons wanted to succeed him. So Herod had a lot of problems. Uh, he, his final illness is recorded for us by Josephus. And Josephus is a first century Jewish historian. Uh, and his book, The Jewish War, tells us much about what was going on in the first century. And it tells us about Herod and his uh, great building projects. And it tells us about his miserable demise, his, his death. If you're interested, you can read about that in, his, in Josephus' book, The Jewish War. Uh, book one, uh, paragraph 656. Herod was buried at a fortress that he built uh, just a little bit uh, east of Bethlehem. And that fortress is known by the name Herodian. And this was Herod's burial place. And you can see the excavation of his tomb there at the Herodian, where his tomb was discovered by archaeologists. When Herod died, his territory was divided up among his three sons. His son Philip inherited the area uh, around the Sea of Galilee, east of the Sea of Galilee, Galanitis and uh, Trachonitis in that area. 
His son Herod Antipas inherited the area to the west of the Sea of Galilee and also the area of Perea, which was east of the Jordan and north of the Dead Sea. His son Archelaus inherited the area of Judea and Samaria, and his territory was divided up after his death in 4 BC. After the birth of Jesus, uh, we recall how he was taken by uh, Joseph and Mary down to Egypt to protect him from uh, Herod's plan to have uh, him murdered. But then after uh, the Herod died, um, then Jesus was brought back uh, to his homeland uh, when Archelaus uh, began to rule in Judea and Samaria. That was not a safe place for him. So Jesus was taken up to Nazareth, and that's where he grew up, in the area of Galilee, in the city of Nazareth. Where is Nazareth? Well, Nazareth is located just north of the Jezreel Valley. And you remember how Jesus went back to his hometown and preached in the synagogue. And he was rejected there by his own people at Nazareth, the people who had seen him grow up the people who knew him as a, as a young man, and he was rejected there. And so he left Nazareth and made his way down to the shores of the Sea of Galilee and made Capernaum his uh, new hometown. And that the, was the center of Jesus' ministry in Galilee. In chapters 5 through 8, we see the proclamation of King Jesus. He's beginning to preach now. Um, he's been baptized, he's been tempted in the wilderness, but now he begins his proclamation. Now, John preceded Jesus, and John was in the wilderness of Judea, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, Matthew 3, verse 2. Jesus began his ministry by saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, Matthew 4:17. <laughs> Do you see the similarity between these uh, messages? What do you see there between the message of John and the message of Jesus? Well, it's pretty obvious. It's the same message. <laughs> it's a message about the kingdom. And John was the one who prepared the way for Jesus' ministry. He is the voice that Isaiah spoke of in Isaiah 40, a voice crying in the wilderness, prepare for the coming of the Lord. And John prepared for the coming of Jesus. And when Jesus came on the scene, John pointed him out as the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And what happened then is that the followers of John began to follow Jesus. John had prepared a messianic movement, which Jesus then took over and began to lead. And so John was the one who went before Jesus, prepared the way for the Lord, and Jesus then took over, preaching the same message as John had preached, repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, Mark and Luke talk about the kingdom of God. Matthew talks about the kingdom of heaven. These are the same concept. The kingdom of God is the kingdom of heaven. But Matthew, sensitive to Jewish um, views, doesn't use the reference, direct reference to God. He uses a euphemism instead. Instead of saying um, a heaven, instead of saying God, the kingdom of God, he says the kingdom of heaven out of respect for God's personal name. And so these are the same concepts, but Matthew is sensitive to his Jewish readers and he uses the term kingdom of heaven instead of kingdom of God. Even today, Jewish people won't refer to God directly. They'll refer to him as uh, the Holy One or uh, Hashem, the name, but they will not refer directly, or uh, Orthodox and observant Jews will not refer directly to God. The kingdom of God. Repent, the kingdom of God is at hand. What does Matthew and what did Jesus mean by the kingdom of God? Well, as we, as we study this concept, we see that the kingdom of God involves a king, first and foremost, a king who rules. But the king has to rule somebody, and he rules a people, a people who are ruled. And then there has to be a place for this kingdom, a place where the king's rule is recognized. 
these three concepts, the king, the people, and the place, make up this, this understanding of the kingdom of God. A king who rules, a people who are ruled, and a place where this rule is recognized. So as you think about the kingdom of God, think in terms of God's people, in God's place, under God's rule. I have my students uh, memorize that. If you're going to talk about the kingdom, you need to begin with this. The kingdom of God is God's people in God's place under God's rule. Now, there's a lot more that we can say about the kingdom of God, but that's a good place to start. That's the basic place to start. But then as we examine this concept further, we realize that the kingdom of God is a present spiritual reality. The kingdom of God is present. God's people, we're here in God's place, the body of Christ, under God's rule through Christ. But this rule of God is going to be realized in physical form someday when Jesus returns, sets up his throne in Jerusalem, and rules the nations of the earth. So it's not only a spiritual reality, it is a physical form that will take place ultimately in the future when Jesus returns. Now, this kingdom was ultimately promised to Abraham in Genesis 12, 1 through 3. A land, a nation, a blessing, all of that is part of the kingdom. The kingdom of God was foreshadowed in the person of David, 2 Samuel chapter 7, where David was promised that he would have a son who would sit on his throne and rule and reign forever. And then Jesus comes along as the king, according to Luke 1, 32 and 33. He's the son of David who will sit on David's throne and rule forever. And now he offers the kingdom to the people of Israel. Repent, the kingdom is at hand, Matthew 4, 17. So Jesus is preaching and teaching about the kingdom. And in Matthew chapter 4, we see how he went about this. Matthew 4, verse 23, he was going throughout Galilee, teaching in the synagogues, proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness among the people. So Jesus was teaching in the synagogues, the gathering place for the Jewish people. He was preaching the message of the kingdom, repent, the kingdom is at hand. But notice also that he was validating his message and his claims with miracles. He was healing every kind of disease among the people. So Jesus had a message, a message he was proclaiming to the Jewish people, and he was validating his message with miracles. What did Jesus teach about the kingdom? Well, we'll see as Matthew continues, Jesus taught that the kingdom would start small, but it would grow to great proportions. It would become large. Jesus taught that the kingdom is a present spiritual reality. That's not, not all there is, but it, it is a present reality. But then he taught that the kingdom will have an ultimate future in physical consummation. And that the kingdom of God is of infinite value. And that it's something to be cherished. It's something to be sought after, God's kingdom. There's much more that Jesus had to say about the kingdom, but this helps us get a start on his teaching about the kingdom. How do you get into God's kingdom? Well, Jesus explains that in Matthew 5.20, where he says, Unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. So righteousness is required for entrance into the kingdom. And that's a really important message because our righteousness is not sufficient to get us into the kingdom nor any works are sufficient to get us into the kingdom. But how do we get the righteousness, which is sufficient to get into the kingdom? We get that righteousness through faith in Jesus. And his righteousness is imparted to us as we trust him for his person and work. Now, Jesus claimed to be God. He claimed to be the Messiah. He offered the kingdom of God to Israel. But what would it take to convince the people that Jesus was the divine Messiah? You know, Jesus didn't bring a passport from heaven. He didn't bring a, a, a business card that 
indicated that he was the Messiah. But what Jesus did were he brought credentials. And these credentials are the miracles that Jesus performed here on this earth. So in Matthew chapters 8 through 10, we see the credentials of King Jesus. We see his miracles, which serve to authenticate that he was whom he claimed to be, the divine son of God, and that his message, which he preached about the kingdom, was true. So the miracles are not just designed to entertain. They're the credentials of King Jesus. So Jesus did a lot of miracles. He healed a leprous man a man who had what we know today as Hansen's disease, where the nerve endings on the fingers and the toes and the ears are, are deadened. And as a result, when they're damaged, you don't care for them because they don't hurt. And eventually infection takes place and people will lose their fingers, lose their toes, lose their earlobes or part of their lips because they've, it's gotten infected and they've never cared for it because they never felt the pain. This is Hansen's disease. And you recall how Jesus healed the leprous person. And this person then um, was, uh, was an illustration of God's power. We go to Isaiah 35, verses 5 and 6, and we see that the healing ministry of Jesus was predicted by the prophet Isaiah. He tells us in the kingdom that the eyes of the blind will be opened. The ears of the deaf will be unstopped. The lame will leap like a deer. The tongue of the mute will shout for joy. And so Jesus healed the blind and the deaf and the lame and the mute in fulfillment of Isaiah 35 verses 5 and 6. Isn't that exciting? Jesus is doing exactly what had been prophesied that the Messiah would do. What we see here in this passage is that the miracles of Jesus are actually a foretaste of the kingdom. When Jesus was doing these miracles, he was giving his, his listeners an idea of what the kingdom would be like. <laughs> and there's going to be no hospitals in the kingdom. There won't be any need for them because Jesus will heal his own in the kingdom. There won't be any need for hospitals or hearing aids or crutches in the kingdom of God. So what a wonderful foretaste of the kingdom as predicted by Isaiah and fulfilled at least in part, by Jesus during his earthly ministry. What was the purpose of this miracle of healing the leprous man? Notice that he is told, go show yourself to the priests for a testimony to them. So the leprous man was to go to Jerusalem, show himself to the priests. This was required by law when someone was healed from leprosy, that they would show themselves to the priest and be declared clean. And when the priest saw this man who had been leprous and he came to Jerusalem and he presented himself, the priest would say, now, how'd this happen? Who did this? And he would give his testimony to the priest. And this would be uh, a way to alert the Jewish establishment in Jerusalem that there's a rabbi up in Galilee performing messianic miracles. And that required then an investigation. Jesus did other miracles. You recall how the, the lame man <clears throat> was, <clears throat> was told, your sins are forgiven. And the religious leader said, how can you uh, forgive sins? Only God can do that. And Jesus responded by saying, I'm going to heal this person as a demonstration that I have such authority. And the lame man was healed. The healing is a proof of the authority of Jesus to forgive sins. It's easy to say, you know, your sins are forgiven. The harder thing is to heal somebody. And Jesus healed the man to show that he had, to, that he had the authority to forgive sins. Jesus claimed to be God. And he proved those claims by his miracles as he ministered around the Sea of Galilee in the various synagogues, in Capernaum, in Chorazin, in Bethsaida, in Magdala, Jesus was ministering, doing miracles, authenticating his message about the kingdom. Controversy developed over the person of the king in chapters 11 through 14, 12. Jesus has presented a message. He's authenticated that message with his miracles. But now we see the religious leaders begin to debate among themselves themselves 
as to whether Jesus is doing these miracles by God's power or by some demonic power. They couldn't deny that Jesus was doing some amazing things. But where was he getting his power? And controversy begins to develop in this section of Matthew's gospel, and this eventually leads to his rejection by the Jewish religious leaders, which sets the course of the nation of Israel on rejecting their Messiah. Jesus did miracles in Chorazin, in Capernaum, in Bethsaida, on the northwest shores of the Sea of Galilee. But the interesting thing is that the Jewish people there did not believe in him. And so we find that Jesus pronounced judgment on these cities where he did most of his miracles, but they didn't result in the faith of the people. Woe to Chorazim, woe to Bethsaida, woe to Capernaum, where Jesus did so many of these miracles, and yet the people rejected him, no doubt influenced by the Jewish religious leaders that doubted Jesus' messianic credentials. There's a controversy we see in chapter 12 over plucking grain on the Sabbath. The disciples were following Jesus through a grain field. And it was permitted in that time that if you were hungry and, and weak from hunger, that you could pluck a handful of grain. You could rub it in your hands to get the, chaff, uh, the, uh, the uh, straw away and the chaff off the grain kernels and then just pop it into your mouth and have a little crunchy treat from the grain. And yet Jesus and his disciples or the disciples were doing this on the Sabbath and they were accused of breaking the Sabbath by harvesting grain. <laughs> All they were doing was just plucking a few kernels of grain, but they were harvesting grain according to the Jewish religious establishment. And the disciples were accused of breaking the Sabbath. And Jesus had to defend his disciples at this point. And he pointed out that the Pharisees were ignorant of the, of the prophets. Had you known what this means, in verse 7, I desire compassion, not sacrificed, you, you would not have condemned the innocent. What is Jesus saying to the Pharisees? <laughs> He's saying, Pharisees, you're, in, you're ignorant of what Hosea said in Hosea 6.6. 6. And what's he say about the disciples? They're innocent. Notice again, uh, had you known what this means, I desire compassion, not sacrifice, you would have not condemned the innocent. The disciples are innocent and the Pharisees are ignorant. You can see how they would get rather annoyed by Jesus. And this brings us to a key turning point in Matthew chapter 12. And this turning point in Matthew 12 sets the nation on the course of rejecting Jesus. And from this point on, in Matthew chapter 12, Jesus knows what his future is going to be in terms of the Jewish religious leaders. He, know, he knows that he is going to be rejected, and he knows that the people will follow him in this rejection. So let's look at this decision, what sets, what sets this decision off. Well, what we see here is there's a man who is demonized. It's often translated, and in, in my Bible, it's translated demon-possessed, but the word is demonized, <clears throat> and this man is demonized. He's been deceived. He's been hurt by these demons. They're, they're influencing him in this powerful way, and <clears throat> so Jesus delivers the man from the demon, and when the Pharisees heard what Jesus had done, they said, you're doing this by Satan's power rather than by God's power. Verse 24 of chapter 12, the Pharisees said, this man casts out demons by the ruler of the demons, by Beelzebul, the ruler of the demons. Beelzebul is another way of referring to um, Satan. And so they say that Jesus is exercising uh, demonic power, getting power from demons instead of power from God. And so they discount the miracle that has taken place. The Jewish religious leaders have rejected this their Jesus sign. Uh, Jesus did this, they say, by the power of Satan, not by the power of the Holy Spirit. And so they reject him on that basis. Now, Matthew chapter 12 is a deciding point in the thinking of the religious leaders. 
And their decision to reject Jesus uh, leads the nation to reject Jesus. The religious leaders really set the pace for the Jewish people, and they reject Jesus because of the leaders who have rejected, rejected Jesus. Matthew chapter 12 is a key turning point in Gospel of Matthew. And from this point on in the life of Jesus, he's dealing with the nation as a people set on the course of rejecting their Messiah. So Matthew 12 uh, is a turning point in the book. As a result of the rejection by the Jewish religious leaders, we see that Jesus now uh, begins to instruct his disciples on their preparation, on, on the needs that they have to understand, the teaching they need to understand in preparation for his um, arrest, his crucifixion, and his death and his return to heaven. So chapter 14, 13 through 20, 34, we see the instruction by King Jesus. He's going to teach his disciples about many things they need to know in light of his imminent departure from the earth. He teaches them about the kingdom. Since he's been rejected by the Jewish religious leaders, his, his disciples wonder, what's going to happen to the kingdom? Since you've been reject, rejected by Israel, has the kingdom been canceled? How will God deal with us as believers until his kingdom is established? And so Jesus is going to go on and teach about the kingdom, but he knows that the kingdom is going to be delayed because of the rejection his rejection by the Jewish religious leaders. The kingdom hasn't been canceled, but it's going to be delayed until there's a generation of believing people who are on the scene at his second coming. Jesus answers a lot of those questions through the parables, and the parables reveal some significant features about the kingdom of God as it's being developed in this present age. The parables are not about the future events of Christ's return. The parables are about the kingdom in this present age, in this time in which we live. And so Jesus teaches the parable of the sower. There's going to be a proclamation of the kingdom in this present age with varying responses depending upon the preparation of the soil and the preparedness of the soil. So Jesus is telling his disciples, look for good soil. Look for people who are responding to the message of the gospel and plant your seeds there. Jesus talks about the parable of the tares. He says uh, there's going to be a counterfeit kingdom, uh, like a field of wheat full of weeds. And those weeds, you can't eat them. Those tares, you can't eat them. You're going to have to pull them out. And God's going to do that when he returns Jesus returns, and then there'll be a judgment. But there'll be counterfeit kingdoms that will parallel the true kingdom in this present age. And you know, you can identify what those counterfeit kingdoms are. They're the false religions of this day. And those are counterfeit kingdoms that parallel the true kingdom of God. And those kingdoms will be judged at the time that Jesus returns. God's going to remove the tares and then harvest the wheat. The parable of the mustard seed. You know, the mustard seed is the smallest of the garden seeds. There are smaller seeds, but it's the smallest of the seeds that are actually planted in a garden. And the mustard plant grows to great proportions. And so Jesus is talking about how a mustard, how the kingdom is like a mustard seed. Starts small, but it grows to great proportions. And that's the way the kingdom will be. Jesus continues his miracles, but they have a different purpose. No longer are they designed to authenticate his ministry and his message, but he's using his miracles to teach his disciples and prepare them for the ministry that they will have after his departure from heaven. So he's using the miracles to teach and to cause the disciples to grow in their understanding of who he is. Jesus teaches on the subject of defilement in chapter 15. The religious leaders, the Pharisees, thought that people would be defiled by what they ate, by the food that goes into the stomach. 
Jesus says, no, people are defiled which by what comes out of the heart. It's not food that defiles, but it what comes out of the heart defiles a person. So Jesus was saying that foods are not the issue. It's what is in the heart that is the real issue. So uh, <laughs> according to this understanding, then a ham sandwich uh, is, is okay, as long as your heart is pure. It's okay to have a uh, a, a crab salad or uh, a meal of lobster. What counts is what comes from your heart, the purity of your heart. Jesus talks about the church. Now, what do most people think of when they hear the word church? I'm going to church today. What church do you attend? Well, usually people think in terms of a building. What Jesus had in mind, though, was a new covenant messianic community, not a building but a people. The church is a people. It's an assembly of called out ones who are uh, benefiting from the new covenant, the blessings of forgiveness, the blessing of being uh, forgiven of sin and being a part of the people of God. This is a messianic community, not just a building, but Jesus teaches about the messianic community. I will build my messianic community. Jesus wasn't about building buildings. He was about building a community of believers. And so he teaches about that in Matthew 16. Jesus teaches about spiritual accountability, normally referred to as church discipline. And this is God's loving plan for restoring sinners to fellowship with himself and the body of Christ. I've written a book on this subject, and it's an important book to understand. It's an important message, uh, a spiritual accountability. How do we hold one another accountable in the body of Christ? In my book, A Guide to Church Discipline, really discusses that and, uh, and, and emphasizes what Jesus taught in Matthew 18, verses 15 through 18. Jesus also taught about marriage and divorce in Matthew chapter uh, 19, verses 1 through 12. And uh, what does the Bible say about divorce? As Christian leaders and as pastors, you need to study Matthew chapter 19, 1 through 12, and examine what the Bible says about the subject of marriage and divorce. I've written a book on this subject called The Divorce Myth. And I point out in The Divorce Myth that God intended marriage to be a lifelong relationship, ending only at death. In Matthew chapter 21 through 23, we see the presentation of King Jesus, and he comes into Jerusalem, and he comes in riding on the colt of a donkey. People waved palm branches as he came into the city. Palm branches were associated in that time with triumph and victory, and Jesus was wave, uh, and they were waving palm branches, thinking of Jesus as coming in as Messiah and King, and they were excited about that. But then we see the religious leaders turn them against Jesus, and later that week, they would cry out for his crucifixion. As Jesus came from Bethany over the Mount of Olives, riding on the colt of a donkey, he passed Bethpage and then descended down into Jerusalem. And I call this the royal entry of Jesus. Some people refer to it as the triumphal entry. But I think the triumphal entry will take place at Jesus' second coming, when he comes into Jerusalem as, as, a, king, as a king, as a, a, a general, uh, on a white horse, as Revelation 20, uh, descri 19 describes it. Uh, but this was his royal entry. He came as a king into Jerusalem. According to Zechariah 9.9, Jesus would, the Messiah would come into Jerusalem riding on the colt of a donkey. And that's exactly what Jesus did. He came in the prophesied way. And Jesus came on the very prophesied day that was mentioned in Daniel's 69 weeks of prophecy. And we could spend some time going into that prophecy in Daniel chapter uh, 9. But uh, just uh, there were there were 69 prophetic weeks and Jesus would come at the end of that period in fulfillment of prophecy. And when the religious leaders told Jesus to quiet the crowds, Jesus said, had you known this day 
and the things that were made for peace. Jesus came on the very prophesied day, according to Daniel 9 and the 69 weeks prophecy. You can check that out in Luke 19, 39 through 42. So Jesus came into Jerusalem in fulfillment of prophecy in the prophesied way and on the very prophesied day. Later that week, the disciples were up on the Mount of Olives admiring uh, the city of Jerusalem and all the temple buildings and the walls and the gates. And as they uh, looked at this beautiful view, uh, Jesus said, not one stone will be left, left on another. It's all going to be destroyed. And that's what happened in AD 70 when the Romans uh, besieged and broke through the walls of Jerusalem and then uh, destroyed the temple. Not one stone was left on another. This is a model of the temple as it would have looked in the time of Jesus, in the time of the first century. Then Jesus goes on to make some predictions in Matthew 24 through 25. These are the predictions of King Jesus. And Jesus is telling his disciples it's going to be a long haul before his second coming. It's going to be longer than you think. So be wise and be discerning as you live your lives in anticipation of his return. Jesus adds that it's going to be harder than you think. There's going to be persecution. There's going to be suffering. So be prepared and be persistent as you continue your ministry in, 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 hopeful, uh, in hopes of his near second coming. And then he says, it's going to be better than you can imagine when I return. And so he, he points them to the difficult times ahead, but also the blessings that are going to be theirs when Jesus returns. And so Matthew 24 and 25, it's an extensive discourse on the future. But Jesus, I, I'm giving a little bit of a summary here of what Jesus is telling us. Ch chapter 26, we see the rejection of King Jesus. And the religious leaders see how the crowds are, are enamored by Jesus. They're, they're wanting him to take the throne and, and to lead the army of Israel against the Romans. And the religious leaders recognize that that's going to cause them a great deal of problem if this crowd has their way. So they say, let's seize him and kill him. But we can't do it during a festival because there's so many people here who want to follow him. And so we see the rejection of King Jesus in Matthew chapter 26. He's arrested, and you know the story of how he was betrayed by Judas uh, there in the Garden of Gethsemane, betrayed with a kiss and arrested. And then we have two trials. There's a religious trial by the Sanhedrin, and Jesus is brought before the religious authorities, and he's accused of blasphemy and accused of saying things against the temple. But the Jews don't have the authority to execute Jesus. They could kick him out of the synagogue. They could uh, punish him in some way, but they couldn't get an execution. That execution is something that only the Romans could carry out. So we have a civil trial as the Jews take Jesus before the civil leader, the Roman governor, Pontius Pilate. And so there's two parts of the trial of Jesus. The religious trial was before the Sanhedrin, and they accused Jesus of blasphemy. And they said that he deserved to die, but they couldn't carry out the capital sentence. So they took Jesus over to Pilate's Praetorium. This was the governor's residence in Jerusalem. He normally uh, was um, living at Caesarea down uh, on the seacoast. But during the festivals, he'd come up to Jerusalem to command the troops that were housed there in the barracks of the Praetorium. And so Pilate would have tried Jesus in this location there north of the temple area in Jerusalem. But you recall how Pilate didn't want to crucify Jesus because he didn't believe that Jesus was a threat to the Roman government. But the Judeans were crying out uh, for his execution. And so finally, uh, Pilate gave in and he washed his hands of the trial and responsibility for the death of Jesus. There's an important question that we have to think about. Should the Jews 
be blamed for Christ's death. You know, many people have carried out anti-Semitic attitudes and actions against the Jewish people because the Judeans there at the trial said, his blood be upon us and our children. Should they bear responsibility for the death of Jesus? Some would say yes, and they persecuted the Jewish people. But notice that the mob at the trial did not represent all the Jewish people. There were just a few there, the, the, the people there at Jerusalem at this particular point. So they, they had no authority to bring guilt on their descendants or all the people of the land. And the New Testament, interestingly, does not blame the Jews for the death of Jesus. Who executed uh, Jesus? It was the Romans. And, uh, and Pilate is the one who authorized this. Ultimately, Gentiles and Jews share in responsibility because we're all sinners, and Jesus had to die for each one of us. Jesus was crucified by the Gentiles, not by the Jews. So there's no biblical basis or logical ba basis in blaming the Jewish people for the death of Jesus. You will come across anti-Semitic attitudes in your, in your life and in your ministry. And these are wrong, they're, they're not biblical, and we should never uh, tolerate anti-Semitism, anti-Jewish language or actions. Jesus was crucified uh, as king of the Jews. Matthew chapter 27, we see uh, how he was crucified. And the cross that Jesus carried was probably the cross beam that was tied to his shoulders and then when he got to the place of the execution, that beam was lifted up, and there would be a place for him to sit, as it were, on the cross, uh, as, as depicted here. There was a discovery in a tomb of nails through the ankle of a crucified victim. And this is the first archaeological evidence of crucifixion. We know that many people were crucified, but here's actual archaeological evidence of the crucifixion that was found in the tomb in Jerusalem with a nail going through the ankle bone. According to archaeologists, they believe in the, uh, the this man was crucified. Yohanan, son of Hagakol, uh, was crucified with his ankles nailed, not uh, individually, but through one large uh, through the uh, a nail going bo through both ankles against the upright post, and the and the nails would go through not the hands because it'd be easy to tear out there from your between your fingers, but actually from your wrists. So this is the depiction as archaeologists understand a crucifixion, and people were crucified naked, so Jesus would have been totally exposed in his crucifixion. Nailing through the wrists, not the hands. And whereas John's gospel mentions, look at my hands, the Greek word is actually your arms. The crucifixion through the forearm uh, with the nails going there. They broke the legs normally of a crucified victim, but you recall in John's gospel uh, that his legs were not broken. The breaking of the legs was not to increase the suffering, but to expedite death. For as long as their legs were intact, they could hold themselves up and uh, get air into their diaphragm and into their lungs and, and breathe. But once the legs were broken, they would pretty much collapse there on the cross and suffocate as a result of the breaking of the legs. The burial of Jesus is an important element in Paul's gospel, as we see in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 4. And why is it necessary for us to believe in the burial of Jesus, as Paul mentions it in 1 Corinthians 15 4? Well, the point here is that G Jesus didn't just pass out. He didn't just swoon or faint, but you only bury dead people. And so the point here in the burial of Jesus is that he actually died. He died for our sins and, uh, and, uh, and then was, was raised from the grave. The resurrection of King Jesus is revealed and recorded for us in Matthew chapter 28. And here we see that, uh, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, that Jesus appeared after his death and his, 
and was raised. He appeared to Mary Magdalene, the first person to whom Jesus appeared after his uh, resurrection. He appeared to some other women. Then he appeared to Simon Peter and to two disciples on the road to Emmaus and to 10 of the apostles that evening, resurrection evening, Jesus appeared to 10. Remember, Thomas was absent and, and uh, Judas had taken his own life, but there were 10 in the upper room. And these were the first of the resurrection appearances, but there were many more, 1 Corinthians 15. But these all took place on the resurrection day, the first day of his resurrection. Jesus uh, told his disciples after his resurrection to leave Galilee or leave uh, Jerusalem and meet him in Galilee. And he told them, there you shall see me. So uh, Jesus would meet them in Galilee. And I, I suggest that the place where they met in Galilee was up on Mount Arbel overlooking the Sea of Galilee. And I've taken many uh, students and, and tour groups up to the top of Mount Arbel. I believe this is probably the place where Jesus met with his disciples and gave them the Great Commission. The Great Commission in Matthew chapter 28 uh, is not go. <laughs> That's not the Great Commission because the disciples were going somewhere. But the point here in this Great Commission, as Jesus met them on the mountain in Galilee, Matthew 28, 16, was uh, to make disciples. That's the imperative. Uh, whereas in verse 19 of Matthew 28, it says, go, therefore, actually, the imperative is make disciples. As you are going, make disciples. And make disciples of whom? Well, not just among the Jewish people, not just in Judea and Samaria, but around the world. Make disciples of all nations, he says. Make disciples of all nations. So there's a universal calling to make disciples around the world. As you're making disciples, learners who are learning about Jesus and beginning to follow him, there's two things that accompany this discipleship ministry. One is to immerse them. We, and uh, the word baptize literally means to immerse. Uh, the word baptize is a Greek word. But how do we translate this Greek word? It means to immerse. The word to baptizo is to um, it is used of people who drown, of ships that sink, uh, and it speaks of those who go under the water in an immersion experience. And so this is an identification ritual that identifies somebody by a recognized ritual of immersion that they're followers of Jesus. And then the second thing they need to be doing is teaching those disciples to observe all that I command you, teaching to observe what Jesus taught. So this is the teaching ministry of discipleship, immersing those who believe and teaching those who believe. And then we have the promise that Jesus makes at the end of the gospel, lo, I'm with you always. I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. You know, the prophecy of Isaiah 714 said, you shall call his name Emmanuel. The Hebrew name Emmanuel means God with us. And while Jesus isn't called Emmanuel by his disciples, nevertheless, he fulfills what Isaiah 714 promised. He is God with us. He is the Emmanuel. And so he fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah 714 by being God with us. Well, these are the these, this is the, com the command that Jesus gave his disciples at the end of his, of his ministry. Matthew doesn't record his ascension, but Luke does, uh, and um, Mark does. Uh, but for Matthew, the, the great focus is to make disciples of all nations. And, you know, you are disciples. You are followers of Jesus. You're learning about him. And uh, this, uh, this command here, applies to us to continue this ministry of making disciples. I trust you'll have a good day and, uh, and, and you'll be able to think through the discussion questions that follow this lecture.